akan terpisah lagi Rangkaian melati yang ku Setiap hari Setiap Wajahmu berseri Penuh harapan suci Semerbak harum mewangi Jasamu Hi, so I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the NUS Baba House. I'm Danielle, uh, Assistant Manager here, and we are very happy to see so many interested individuals online, especially during this time when holding our talks physically is not yet possible. So the talk that you've signed up to attend this evening is part of the Dialects and Dialogues Language Speaker Series. This series was devised to complement the discussions within the NUS Baba House's current exhibition, Glossaries of the Straits Chinese Homemaking on Identity Formation Among Early Settlers in Colonial Singapore. So we take reference from Professor Wang Gangwu's observation that languages in early Singapore were pre-national, that is, they did not follow national borders. As such, various languages and recombinants of those began flourishing in the region, facilitated through trade and migration among the populations. The four talks in this series, happening over four weeks, address various linguistic and literary trends in Southeast Asia, Singapore, and within the Pranakan community. So to kick off the series, we are very honored to have with us Dr. Phyllis Chu, who will open the series with a fascinating history of early identities in Singapore and the Pranakan community, as examined through the retrospective lens of history and language. She has chosen to approach this topic through a long view which allows us to flesh out unexpected socio-political and linguistic insights. Dr. Chu was a professor at the National Institute of Education until her retirement in December 2019. She was Fulbright visiting professor to Harvard University in 2010, as well as the 2012 Leverholm visiting professor to the UK. She is past president of the Association of Women for Action and Research, or AWARE, the University Women's Association of Singapore, and the English Language and Literature Association of Singapore. She has also written about her connection to heritage in the July 2010 issue of BiblioAsia, which is accessible for free online, which is very interesting as it details her experiences growing up in the 1950s and 60s, as well as her Pranakan family tree. So I'll quickly pass the time over now to Dr. Phyllis Chu, who will begin her sharing. Uh, greetings, everyone. Dear friends, can you hear me loud and clear? Uh, Daniel? Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to start now. And uh, I'm going to start with some keywords because you're going to hear these words in the next uh, 50 minutes. So I thought that I'll just uh, introduce the words so that uh, it'll be very easily comprehensible. As you know, the keywords are language, change and identity. And I chose to do this talk through the lens of language because that's very unusual. Most people do it uh, you know, through the lens of kings and queens. They do it through the lens of history or, you know, or they, they do it through the lens of war or even through the lens of geography. But I want to do it through the lens of, of language. Uh, language is very invisible. It is an artifact. It is a symbol, it's symbolic. And it is the chief carrier. It is the chief carrier of culture. So uh, that's something that we didn't, most people don't realize. Okay, and then I'm going to talk about language change. Language also the chief carrier of identity. Okay? So when we talk about language, we're not just talking about grammar. I will, I will not say very much about that because I know that my audience is very general. Okay, so uh, I just want to show the relationship of of, of language to change and to culture and to identity. Okay, in the Baba Noya community, uh, pre-national, uh, pre-national period. We're going to talk also about accommodation, about assimilation, about acculturation. Now these are big words, right? But that's all that's all about the 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 the, uh, the big words. Uh, and this actually uh, is basically the summary, you know of pre-national uh, Baba Nuya culture. Then I'm going to use words like Paranakan, uh, words like uh, Baba, uh, Nuya, okay? Uh, Baba actually is a uh, Hindu, originate, originated from Hindustani, okay? And actually it means like grandfather or, or very nice familiar term, but it's been uh, adopted, you know, uh, to, to, to denote the, 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 the male of the, uh, uh, of the Paranakans. I'm going to use it interchangeably. Of course, there are differences, but for this talk, which is meant to be general, I will use Baba, Nonya, Paranakan interchange, interchangeably. Paranakan actually is Indonesian word for descendant, okay? Then there's also words like straight Chinese and straight born. Of course, there's a difference, but for this talk, I, I'm not going to go into details, okay? I, I'm just going to be very macro. So let's just uh, use it interchangeably, okay? For the next uh, uh, 45 minutes. Then uh, the keyword also is dialect, dialect. So this is very interesting because most people, they just want to talk about language because language has status, you see. Dialect doesn't have status, right? And so in our history, very few people talk about dialect. It's associated with the low class. Okay, uh, so uh, so it's nice for a change to talk about dialects and uh, to talk about dialogue because dialects and dialogues are actually associated with the oral domain, oral domain, and that's interesting. That's life. That's real life. Okay, and then I'll talk also of, uh, of two. I'll introduce two technical words: pigeon and creole, because this history of the Baba Noya uh, language is actually a history, you know, of, of the Creole in Singapore that so few people know about. So that's it. That's, uh, that's uh, enough for housekeeping. And before I move on, just to let you know, as Daniel has already warned you, I'm going to do a macro view, okay? I'm going to do a diachronic view. I'm going to use a broad canvas. I'm going to use a very broad brush, okay? Uh, because I want you to see the big picture. I'm going to use a very wide screen, okay? Because I think the majority of you are not linguists. So I think uh, this is the best way. I'll use a very broad brush in my talk. Okay, how come I'm interested in this subject? Well, you know, when I was in school, my history teacher told me that Stanford Raffles founded Singapore, which means Singapore wasn't there. It was only founded in 1819. 
and that uh, it was a deserted island, perhaps only for a few fishermen. And uh, that's it. That was the history that we learned uh, for like 10 years, 12 years, you know, and even through, even when I, I, I went to the university, that was the history that I was told. And then later on, I found out that actually, uh, wow, Singapore has a lot of names. It has a lot of names. So if it has a lot of names, many of which predates 1819, the supposed founding of Singapore by an Englishman called Stamford Raffles, then there must have been some history before it that wasn't in the history textbooks. Okay. So I began to find out that, oh, okay, Singa the original name actually is not Singapore. It's actually Singapura. But they anglicized it, make it Singapore rather than the Sanskrit word. Okay, then I, I found out that actually it has an even older name called Tamasic. Okay, it, it, it's called uh, C Tamasic, uh, C C town, C town. So how, what is this Tamasic then? How come it's not in our history book? It predates Raffles, you see. Then there are also documents that call it Pulau Panjan, Panjan. Actually, I don't think it refers to Singapore. I think it refers because the shape of Singapore is not really panjang, long. Nah? I think it refers more to Pulau Sentosa. At that time, it was known as Pulau Belakang Mati. But anyway, in some of the records, they mixed up uh, Singapore and, and Belakang Mati. So they call it Pulau Panjang in some of the records. Okay? And then there are also uh, manuscripts that refer to Pulau Ujong, which is the island at the tip of the peninsula. Uh, and they also have a Chinese name for that. All right. My, my goodness, in the 12th century, uh, now that we've seen some Chinese documents, uh, you know, Panzu, you know, it's, it's, it's an old name for Singapore. They even have uh, in the Mongols, uh, documents by the, the Mongols in the 13th century China, they refer to Singapore as Lungya Men, the dragon, tooth, gate. Hey, Singapore existed in the 12th century, in the 13th century. So nobody found that it, it was there, right? Then there were words like Malaya. Hey, Malaya, it's a Tamil word. It's a word from the Tamil language, all right? It means a hill, a hill town, a hill town. So the Tamils were here because if they were not here, how come they have a name for it way before the British came? So I was enthralled. I was true. I was fascinated. I said, where am I living? You know, it, it kind of has just happened in 1819. And then, of course, there was Sabana. Sabana is a, it's a term that Ptolemy, you know, Ptolemy, the Greek astronomer and philosopher, he drew a map, all right, at the turn of the century, uh, uh, you know, uh, that means around zero to 100 CE. That's 2,000 years ago. He drew a map and he calls us Sabana. He calls us Sabana. Hey, guys, that's 2,000 years ago. But of course, because our climate is very humid, it's very hard to find, you know, the fossils and relics. But thank goodness, uh, in the last 20 years, we had, uh, we had archaeologists like Nizik, uh, who went to dig at the Padang. And, and found quite a lot of uh, Chinese uh, fragments and so forth dating, you know, back to the 12th century, all right, which is like 800 years ago. Okay, maybe 2,000 years is a little hard to find because of the humidity. But, well, at least we got 800-year-old uh, 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 fragments and shards, all right? So that's how I got interested to find out about real history of where I stay. Okay. So now let's go on now to, 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 to this multilingual, multicultural heritage that we have that has been forgotten because, as you know, in the last 50 years, we've all been put into little boxes and little silos. Okay, we have a CMIO model, which is Chinese, Indian, Malay, and that's it. You've got to, you got to say which silo you belong to. But look at what I found in my in my broad canvas of reading, you know, I found in the 12th century, there was this guy called Cho, you know, Tao, and he, and he said this, let me translate. Since rice is easily had, women easily persuaded. A great many Chinese sailors has taken up permanent residence. Hey guys, that's 800 years ago. Okay, 
and uh, even for British uh, uh, writers, even like Vaughan and uh, you know, and in the in the nineteenth century, he 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 did mention you know in many of his writings in the nineteenth century there were lots of half caste. That's what they call them, half caste Chinese. This is from the viewpoint of the British. Okay, anybody who's not white is half caste lah. So half caste Chinese having Malay mothers. Okay, there was also talk of symbiosis with local people. I quote unquote. And Anthony Reid, who was here in Singapore for a long time, fantastic historian, and, and he says that, you know, the people with labels such as Javanese, Malay, Luzon, Javi, uh, uh, are likely to have been fathered by the Chinese. This is what he says, okay? And you know, uh, Anthony Reid is a very uh, 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 respected uh, historian, okay? And of course, we have Mixing, which I was talking to you about, a theologist. And he says the mixed marriages were very, very common. All right. So this was a very multilingual, multicultural society. This is our ancestors huh, of the Noyas and the Babas. I just like to tell you that although I'm talking about Singapore, okay, because Singapore is supposed to be the El Dorado, it's supposed to be the nexus of Southeast Asia, it's supposed to be the New York of Southeast Asia, it's supposed to be the center of the string of necklace which is like, a, shall we say, a string of pearls, the Nusantara across, across the sea, you know, in between the great civilization of China and India. All right, so in the string of pearls, right in the center, we have Singapore. But let me tell you, that although I'm just talking about Singapore, okay, there are many other pearls where you can find, uh, you know, uh, Creole, the Creole, the Babas, the Noyas, okay? And uh, have you heard of Bangka Bilitong Islands? No, there's a community there. There's a history there. I'm not talking about it, but I just want to tell you. Do you know there was a Chinese queen in Aceh? A very fascinating story. I can't talk about that now, but why don't you go and find out? Uh, the Aceh had settlements from people from Vietnam, etc., four, five hundred years ago. I'm sure then you have heard of the story of Hang Lipo, which was uh, supposedly supposedly to be a daughter of the Chinese emperor. Okay. And she came here uh, with 500 nobility. Okay. And they all settled in Malacca. All right. And uh, they, they were Chinese. Uh, Han Jeba, Hang Tua from the Malay annals, they were Chinese and including Hang Lipo. And, uh, and they married the local people, you know, uh, the, the men, there were 500, supposedly 500 men who accompanied her from the nobility class. Emperor has a lot of wives. You know, that's why they have so much, so, so many people there. Okay, and then another thing, have you heard about the Hana, Hanifi, Hanafi networks? This is the Muslim network, you know, uh, in Palambang, in Sambas, hey, by the way, these are all the towns in Indonesia. Okay, Saribon, Lasem, Samarang, Gresik. Go and find out there are Chinese settlements there, hundreds of years. Okay, they like the Baba and Noyas of Singapore. All right. And of course, you may have heard of Demak, which is still there. You may, you, you may have heard that, you know, uh, uh, look at the Chinese temple, by the way. This, this picture is, a, is of Demak. Doesn't it look Chinese? Hey guys, it's 14th century. Okay, so. I'm not talking about this, but I just want to tell you that it's, it's, it's uh, many hundred of years, so there are native speakers. Okay, I know that Anne Pakir, in her PhD thesis, all right, she said that uh, Baba Malay is probably has only 200 years of native speakers, but you see, Anne Pakir wrote her thesis in the 1980s, okay, uh, early, early, early 1980s. And after that, then we had all these uh, archaeological uh, discoveries at the Padang. So uh, definitely, is there's definitely more than 200 years of native speakers. Okay, so the first thing I want to stress, okay, is the synthesis, very, very syncretic culture that we find. And I think the best example, and I chose to show this, is the, Tan the Tanjong Kling Mosque in Malacca. You can see from this, uh, architecture here, all right, that uh, is Chinese, and then it's Islamic, and it's also Indian. Isn't that interesting? If you go inside, you can see a real mishmash. So this was uh, uh, accepted, you know, it's accepted. They, they view assimilation, they view acculturation, they view accommodation as something that was quite natural, right? It's something that was complementary. 
Okay, so this was the multicultural culture at the time. It was very flexible. It was very open. It was very open. Okay, there was a free flow. Let's look at religion, for instance. Okay, you can already see that in this region, the region of the Nusantara, we had the the, the Buddhist the Buddhist culture overlay on the Hindu culture, all right, in, 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 in Indonesian islands. And then after that, the Muslim, the Islamic culture overlay, it was very easy to overlay on it because the Islamic uh, version was the Sufi version, which was quite, you know, eclectic. So, so it was easy to overlay. And, and you know, the Chinese has adopted the word Dato. Uh, of course, in Malay, it means grandfather, but we we change the meaning a little bit. Uh, not the straight Chinese. We call, we call it like the ancestor, or uh, you know, to, to be venerated. And we've adopted the karamat shrines that the Malay. This is post national after after post national Islam changed its face. It's no longer so uh, flexible. So and all the karamat shrines were all uh, discarded. Now who picked them up? Chinese picks them up. Okay, because. It's all right. We're very syncretic. Our religion is a mixture of uh, Taoism, it's a mixture of Buddhism, it's a mixture of Confucianism, it's a mixture of shamanism. Hey, come on. Just another dato. Oh, it's nice. Okay. So don't believe the British uh, census record, which began in the late 19th century, where they listed Taoism as one religion on its own, Buddhism as another religion on its own. Uh, because, you know, they wanted to be very systematic, very scientific. They wanted to classify everything and everything is very neat and in boxes. But I want to tell you that the history of this region, the local history, as portrayed by its language, because language is a symbol, is the chief identifier of the culture. The syncreticness of the language is a reflection, okay, of the culture itself, which is also syncretic. If the language is syncretic, the culture is syncretic. Okay? The language does not lie. Yeah, of course, the Straits Chinese religion, I know of many Baba and Muyas who also consult the service of the Bomos. All right? Are we talking about pre-national days? Huh? Uh, so here it is using the service of the Bomo and with some help from Tuate Kong, no problem, no problem. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? Okay, so we still pray to Tikong, Tikong, uh, Tikong, which is uh, Tian, all right, or heaven, whatever it is. And, uh, and also the datos, okay, the different datos. All right, so, 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 so this is, uh, uh, you can find this in straight Chinese houses as well. Of course, straight Chinese were also Christians and there were some who were also Muslims, okay, but uh, why the 20th century, the British had encouraged them, you know, to uh, not to uh, not to be so Muslim, you know, because they have reserved. That's that's the British huh? they have reserved uh, the Islamic faith for the Malays. Okay, but in the beginning, in the beginning, remember Admiral Chang He, he's a Muslim. Come on, there were many Chinese who were Muslims, but of course, all right. Later on, when the British took over, they were not encouraged, really, all right? But the Chinese were Muslims. They were the ones who, hey, converted Harames Wara. Do you remember him? He was a refugee from Kalimbang. The story goes that he fled because of a succession dispute. He fled to Tamasik, old name of Singapore, about 500 years ago. And from there, he made his way to Malacca and became the first Sultan of Malacca. Hey, who converted him? He, he learned that religion from Admiral Chen He. By the way, China was a world power in the 15th century. It, 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 uh, it was a superpower in the 15th century. This is just before the European Renaissance. China could have, could have conquered the world if it had wanted to. If it had wanted to. But that's not the Chinese style. You know, I think... Uh, even today, you can see that they rather go for infrastructure and things like that. Okay, let's uh, go on now. And it's very multicultural. So uh, uh, the Straits Chinese were friends of the Indians. 
I remember that uh, my father uh, used to have a sick guards in his office they would hire them to sleep they would bring their chapoy you know which is a bed made of jute sometimes they have a bed of nails as well as a child i was so fascinated how could anyone sleep on a bed of nails and they did they usually sleep outside the office and my uncle also outside his home because you know if you don't want any burglars you get some body bring his bed along and, and sleep uh, right across your front door all right so the Chinese use them, the, uh, the, the, that is the Straits Chinese. They, they're, they're very easy with them. And even when uh, in the graves, in life and in death, let us have the Sikhs to guard us, okay? Uh, we're very pra practical. And of course, there were a lot of interracial marriages. Okay, this is, uh, shall we say, up to the end of the 19th century, all right? Later on, I'll talk about 20th century. Then there'll be some changes, okay? So there was a lot of accommodation, assimilation, acculturation. You can see here an Indian marrying a Chinese. Oh, I like this person. Uh, what's the oh, God, i forgotten. Um, Morris Baker, right? Uh, Morris Baker was my professor when I was... I was in a university, okay? And uh, during my first year, and he always says, uh, he told us the story of his childhood and he said, uh, well, I'm my uh, English father, English and Indian, and he's mixed up. Huh? And he says, uh, uh, you know, when I was young, uh, the people in the, where I live, he lived, he lived in Malaysia. We were all part of the straight settlements. He says that we we'll call this a mother, mother donkey, father horse. So I mother, he, he, he was joking, okay? So this is just to let you know uh, how flexible, open uh, we were. And if you just read the book, not just the autobiography of Maurice Baker, you can read the autobiography of J.R. Nathan, our past president, late president. Go ahead and read the autobiography of Joe Conciesco. He, he tells us how, he, you know, he tells us about Katong and, and, and the, the multiculturalism, how, the, how, you know, the Malays and Chinese and the pigs and the, the pigs and the goats and the cows all live uh, very nearby and were friends of each other. Okay, go and read the autobiography of Lee Kun Choi. You see how uh, syncretic multicultural it is. Go and read the autobiography of Offman Walk. Just uh, go to the library. Okay. Well, it's seven o'clock, so I'm thinking of food. So, uh, <clears throat> Let's look a little bit at the Nonya food. You can see here is a favorite dish of laksa, which is Chinese noodles, right? Chinese rice noodle, okay? And what is this? With mm, local coconut, okay, local chili, right? You can only find laksa here, by the way. This is Nonya uh, Paranakan dish. I'm going to use all these words interchangeably. Yeah? And there are many such food, okay, which betrays our very syncretic heritage, okay? And uh, you can see here, uh, sat uh, uh, satay sauce, you can see nasi lemak. These are all cr very Creole-like, okay? And, uh, and, and, and all these are the food, okay? I can't really see very well, this thing must be the light. Okay, look at the Paranakan desserts, look at our kaya, uh, look at our gorgeous, Noya tarts. Hey, you can't find this in China, you know. And if the Noyas and Babas weren't here, <laughs> there won't be any tarts. <laughs> uh, there won't be any of all these uh, kwe kwe, which is a little bit of Indian, a little bit of uh, Malay, Indonesian, and a little bit of Chinese. So we have a uh, Creole food, okay? And you know how delicious it is, all right? So, uh, 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 oh, yeah. And so we even changed the nomenclature, the names, the names have changed. And Tao Yu Ba, which is very Chinese, huh, has now become Babi Pong Te. Okay, we add some chili into it. We jazz it up a little bit lah, so that it has a kick, okay, with some of the local spices. And there are many such dishes like this, okay. This uh, reveals, you know, that you know, there was a lot of mixing and it was felt to be very, very natural, okay? For hundreds of years, there were native speakers for at least 500, 600 years, native speakers 
of Baba language. Later, I will talk about Baba language. But I just show you the food first. Let me just show you the, a bit of the architecture first. It's not Chinese. It's not Malay. It's just a Baba Noya. It's just Peranakan, okay? The architecture, uh, look at this. It's not Chinese. It's not Malay. It's very, very localized, all right? Look at the jewelry. Where can you find? It's not, it's not really Indonesian. It's not really Malay. It's a bit of Chinese and Malay. It's a bit of Indian. It's a bit of Sinhalese. I got this card by D Silver. Because the streets Chinese, I remember, used to buy a lot of jewelry from the uh, from the Sinhalese, from the Sinhalese who were very, very excellent jewelers. Okay. So they traded with everyone. And as you know, uh, Singapore is has always been a about well, a free port, all right. That's why it thrived. It has always been very, very open. It has always been a city of migrants. It is a polyglot pot, right? One of the most successful in the world, okay? And so we have all these uh, races together. And among the races were, of course, the straight Chinese. Now, I am going to talk about it through the lens of language. So now that I have whetted your appetite a bit by talking about... <clears throat> By talking about food and by talking about architecture and by talking about jewelry. Let me now talk a little bit about language, okay? Because language reflects the culture. Okay? Language reflects the culture. Now, if you look at this picture closely, can you see Indians? Can you see Chinese? All right. Or uh, can you see uh, you know there, there are many races? And by the way, when you say Chinese, it's not a monolithic term, you know. What sort of Chinese? Are you talking about Hakka speakers? You know, are, are you talking for people from Chaozhou or from Jianzhou or from uh, where, where, from Xiamen or from Guangzhou? Uh, you know, uh, what sort of language are you talking? Are you talking about Hokchu or Hoklo or, 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 or Cantonese or Teju, you know, or, 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 or Fuchao or, or Putian? What? Hey, what, what, what kind of Chinese are you talking about? And by the way, all these Languages are mutually unintelligible. And that's why I call them languages. I don't call them dialects. Let the government call them dialects, okay? Because they got their own political motives to call them dialects. But we linguists, we call them languages because as long as it's mutually unintelligible, just like Hokkien and Mandarin, it's mutually unintelligible. So it's a language, all right? So uh, let me just call them uh, language then, all right? Because a language is, has an army and a navy. And a dialect doesn't have an army and a navy, all right? So Hokkien doesn't have an army and navy, so it's a dialect. But we know it's a language, okay? We know it's a language. There are 60 million speakers of Hokkien in the mainland, even today. And it has its own vocabulary. It's even older, much older language than Mandarin. And by the way, Mandarin has four tones. Hokkien has seven tones. Hokkien is an ancient language. It was the language of the Tang Emperor. And when you read the poetry from the Tang Dynasty, it rhymes in Hokkien. It doesn't rhyme in Mandarin. You want to call it a dialect? Let's call it a language. So. That's for Chinese. Look at the picture. They're all Indians. Come on. It's not just one language. Are you talking about Malayana? Are you talking about Sinhalese? Are you talking about Telugu? Are you talking about Urdu? Are you talking about Punjabi? Are you talking about Gujarati? What are you talking about? We can't communicate with one another. There is no one Indian language. There is no one Chinese language. And we are here in Singapore. So what shall we do, dear friends? Even the Malays cannot communicate among themselves. Are you speaking Boyanese? Are you speaking Makaris? Are you speaking Minangkabau? Are you speaking Javanese? Are you speaking Celebes? What on earth are you speaking? We can't understand a word. It's mutually unintelligible. They are different languages. How shall we communicate? In this El Dorado that we found ourselves in, we came here to trade. 
we came here to make a fortune. How shall we talk to one another? Within ourselves, within the Chinese race, within the Malay race, within the Indian race, across the races. What about the Eurasians? What about the Indo-Chinese who are here? There were Burmese who were here. There were Thais who were here. There were Filipinos who were here. How shall we come? Okay. Uh, let's just flash back a little. Uh, let's come back a little more recent. Even in this phrase that we hear today, yeah, coming back to today now, sometimes I, I get out of the picture, you know. I know that uh, I'm supposed to stick to pre-national, but sometimes, forgive me, I, I just get out of the frame a little bit. They all being Koso. They, what language is that? Oh, what language is that? Bing? What language is that? Koso, what language is that? Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, O could be, uh, well, O, uh, it could be, I don't know, Arabic, but zero or Indian. Okay. Who invented zero? Bing, Bing is Cantonese, right? Kosong is, is Malay. Te, 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 Chinese, Southern Chinese, not Northern. Huh? Northern Chinese is Cha. See the difference? Very, very different, right? I told you they are not mutually unintelligible. Okay. So this is a hodgepodge. So now, since the Hokkien's, that is the people from Siamen or Amoy, yeah? it was called Amoy before, Siamen today, Fujian province, they were the ones who came out, okay? Including those from Guang, Guangzhou, as well as Guangdong, Guang, Guangdong, okay? And also Zhaozhou, all right? But the Hokkien's were the one who came very much earlier, hundreds of years. So we find that they are Malay, the Malays were very accommodative, all right? They welcome Hokkien. And how do we know? Because all these words are in the Malay language, all right? And if you look at the Malay dictionary in the 60s and 70s, as well as 80s, you'll find a lot of Hokkien words. You know, you can find about like 20% of Hokkien words. Let's look at the etymology, but recent dictionary, they don't love Hokkien very much, all right? So, in the recent dictionary, we have a lot more Islamic words. I told you that language is a mirror of ideology, right? So if you look up an early Malay dictionary, you'll find lots of Hokkien words, lots and lots. And you go, oh, by the way, it's not just Hokkien words that the Malay embrace. Malays are very open people. Huh? They, they're very flexible. I mean, pre-national, I'm talking about pre-national. Uh, Malay language has, has, has has many Portuguese words, many, many. Uh, it has many Sanskrit words, Pamaisura, Pamaisungri, Raja, you know, I have a lot, a lot about 20-30%. Look at the early dictionary, not the latest one, because the latest one, uh, they want to get rid of all their, they want to get rid of all their Hindu Sanskrit words, they want to get rid of their Hokkien words, all right? But language cannot lie. It, uh, because, uh, uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can uh, cover the uh, you can cover the archaeological sites to disguise the past. Just fill it up with earth. But what about the language? What about your words like ba chang ba pao ching chao bi hun? How are you going to bury them? Archaeologically, it's still here. We tell, you know, all these are Lao Ting and all these are Hokkien words. Uh, how are you going to bury them? You can't. So language has uh, <clears throat> signals of your past heritage. It's going to be very hard to, <laughs> going to be very hard to disguise the past. Okay, if we study the etymological roots of language, of the Malay language. Now, in turn, just as Malay welcome language, Pre-national, lots of Malays could speak Hokkien. Really, they could speak Hokkien. They were Hokkien speakers, right? And we find that Hokkien in turn, the Hokkien Chinese in turn, embrace Malay. Okay, they love each other, all right? And when you love each other, uh, well, you, 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 you just uh, mix up your words together. You code mix, okay? So Hokkien and Malay all just mixed up together. 
If only the tape recorder, etc., were invented, okay, in the 19th century, we could have just be amazed huh, if we can hear the marriage of Hokkien and the marriage of, uh, of Malay. Okay, so there were many words like this. It was not just a marriage of the language, because language is just a mirror of the culture. Language is a mirror of your ideology. Language is a mirror of your thoughts, of your affection. Language is a mirror of your affiliation, of your friendship. There was pantons, the Chinese, the Babas and the Noyas. I won't talk very much about this because I know that Prof, uh, Professor Azza, I think, yeah, uh, Dr. Azha, all right? He's going to talk about this. So let him go and talk to you about the, the Sias and the pantons, you know? Uh, the Babas and the Noyas pre-war, they were very good in this. They could compose pantoons on the spot that rhymes. It was very beautiful, you know. What about their dance, the Karonchong, the Ronggeng, the Bangsawan, they just love it. Go and read Lee Kun Choi's uh, autobiography. He said, just, we just love the, the Bangsawan, you know. It was just part of them, they just love this culture, all right. And it, it was just so natural, uh, you know, to be multicultural, to be assimilative, okay? And of course, this is a new country. So uh, if there were some words that, uh, some things we had to refer to, we would invent words if, if none had existed before, okay? So these were the words they invented. And the Chinese and the Malays used it together, okay? And by the way, there were a lot of intermarriages, okay? Malays used to, the, uh, the straight Chinese and the Malays, they used to adopt lots of babies and children from the, from the Sinkates, the, 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 the new Chinese that just came who didn't like girls. The, the Babas and Noyas were very much like the Malays. They, oh, if you don't want your daughter out, we'll just take it. You know what I mean? You don't want your baby, we'll just take it. All right? So these were the words they, 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 uh, they, they had uh, invented. And uh, I've just, actually, I've collected hundreds of words, but, you know, I just show you a sample, all right? So these are coinages of new words, okay? Like uh, wooden uh, uh, wooden clocks and uh, things like that. Nah? Purse, purse worn on the belt. And here, of course, you can see uh, patterns of the kasok, kasok money, money. You can't find this anywhere. This is part of the streets. Chinese, they, I think they adopted from the Indonesian and then, they use all the small little beads from China. And then, you know, look at the motif. Okay. And it's reflected in the language. All right. And guys, it's not just Hokkien and Malay. Very boring. Uh, you know, for food, uh, we need lots of spices. So let's have a dash of Kristan as well. Kristan is the Portuguese, uh, Portuguese and Malay language from Malacca. Hey, by the way, it's not just... There are many kinds of Eurasians, you know, just as there are many kinds of Chinese, many kinds of Indians, all right? Uh, there are also many kinds of Eurasians. Huh? They, 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 some of them may be Dutch and uh, Dutch and Indian. Some are British and uh, some are Scottish and, you know, so there are also many kinds of Eurasian. And so the Christian are the Portuguese. Okay, with the Malay. Look at all the Christian words that Malay have absorbed. I told you that the Malay language is a very open language, okay? It is... Uh, somebody said that the Malays are lost in translation. Uh, just everything they adopt. Uh, Malay is quite a, a new language. Uh, okay, uh, right. So, 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 so they adopted from Chinese words, especially Hokkien. Uh, especially Hokkien. They had words from Krista. All right. So all these words went into Baba Malay. Ah, uh, by the way, in case you're wondering, hey, what is Malay? What is Baba Malay? I would say that Baba Malay is a subset of Baza Malay, Baza Malay. Because at that time, there's no standard Malay. Hey, by, when we talk about standard Malay, it's already post-national, okay? Because Indonesia got its independence in 1947. Uh, of course, the Dutch only recognized it in 49. Malaysia got its independence in 57. So before that, that is not national. After, only after these dates, uh, then we have a term called standard Malay. Before that, Malay lah. Okay, it's just Malay. Baza Malay. What is Baza Malay? Market Malay. What is Market Malay? It's Johor Malay. It's the Malay spoken by the trades people. Malay spoken by the pirates. 
the Johor Sultanate was very powerful at that time. So Johor Malay became the standard Malay. Okay, it, it was a very uh, a language of the marketplace. So shall we say that the Cinderella of the Nusantara was elevated to become the princess because it was a language that could unite everyone. It was a language that uh, was spoken not just by the Babas and Nunyas, but by almost everyone was the language of trade. All right, We can't be choosing Javanese. That's the language of the king and queen. Do you want to get, get the other people angry? Because you know the Javanese used to be conquerors of Majapahit and Sri Vijaya. I don't think they would want their language. We rather speak the language of the pirates. Uh, all right, so let's us all speak the language of Cinderella. And so Baba Malay is a subset of Baza Malay. There are many, many similarities, but maybe the pronunciation a little bit different. I'll show you some examples later, okay? But they are very, very similar, okay? They are mutually intelligible. Uh, so you, we can call both of them their dialects huh? because we can understand. So let's put a dash of Kristan. Let's put a dash of Sanskrit okay, into the language, which will be the lingua franca of all the masses, Baza Malay, all right, as well as Baba Malay, they're almost similar, except for some words in the pronunciation. So let's sprinkle all this and let's have some Indian words as well, all right, so that it will be our lingua franca. So these are some of the Indian words that you can find, all right, in some of the data, uh, you know, for Baba Malay, Baza Malay, and so forth. Let me give you a simple serving. Let me give you a simple linguistic serving of Creole. Right? For example, I say, uh, Ruma Saya. I will say, uh, Saya Mia Ruma. Saya Mia Ruma. Okay, that's okay. Or Saya Kasi Pukul Dia. All right? Ini bukan Mama Mia. Uh, you know, things like this. And so this, even the days of the week. Okay, Hari Satu, Hari Dua, Hari Tiga. This is following the, the Chinese, the Hokkien. Hokkien, I forgot how to speak Hokkien. You know? So the Malays also follow the days of the week from Hokkien, Hari Satu, Hari Dua. It's only later, post national, uh, then they begin to say Hari Isnin. Hari Selasa, to be more refined, you know, to be more standard. But we're talking about pre-national, okay? So here is, all right? Uh, here, here, here are some samples, okay? Here's a letter in uh, Baba Malay. Wah ikut itu jantan, okay? Uh, it is actually from the Hokkien uh, syntax. Watoi hele tapo. Luai, luai homai. Eh, luai kasi, luai kasi mai. All right, so the uh, uh, Baba Malay is following the Hokkien syntactic structure. Okay, so the original uh, Baba Malay is actually basically number one Malay, main ingredient, number two Hokkien. This guy here is Munshi Abdallah. He's the first linguist in Singapore and he speaks like five languages. He speaks Hindi, he speaks Tamil, he speaks uh, Malay, of course. He was secretary to Raffles, he speaks English. Yeah, and he speaks Hokkien. Isn't that great? Okay, and of course he's a. Uh, I think uh, I think he's Javi Paranakan or Indian, definitely Indian Muslim. Okay, or, uh, Javi Paranakan and Javi Paranakan is like the 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 it's like the Chinese para, Paranakan. The, the, is, that's another story also. That's also another crew. That's also very interesting. Okay, so Hokkien has become so nativized. It has become so nativized in this part of the world that today, if you go back to Siaman or Amoy, lah, okay, that's how it was called then. If you go back to Amoy or Siaman today, my goodness, lah, look at the words, they're all completely changed. You won't be able to, they won't be able to understand you. And in fact, I did go back to Siaman 10 years ago and I tried to speak Hokkien and definitely didn't understand me. I only understood 10% of the words. That's how nativized they've become. Okay, and if Hokkien had continued, if Hokkien continues, it will be a different language altogether. Right now it's a dialect huh? because you can kind of like guess, guess, gasa, gasa, huh? so to speak. All right, but uh, 
uh, it's so different now. It's so different now, okay? So, Baza Malay, Baba Malay. Now, I hope you know the difference. One is a subset of the other, okay? And both Baza Malay and Baba Malay, they use Gua, Gua meaning I, Saya, and Lu. Uh, instead of saying Awa, you say Lu, uh, Lu. All right, so they are rather similar, actually. Okay, so then what is the difference? The, the difference is this. Because to be straight Chinese, to be Baba and Noya in the 19th century was a big thing, you know. All right, even before the war, it was high status because the Babas and the Noyas, they were the early migrants, they have early migrants, they have lots of accumulated privileges. All right, so the British gave them their businesses, the British, the British liked them, they were in white collar jobs, you know, and so forth. So they also began to speak a little differently. Okay, because you have high status, you want to differentiate yourself from all the masses who are speaking Baza Malay. So what do you do? For example, they may drop the H sound. Instead of saying Hari, they say Ari. Instead of saying Harap, they say Arab. All right. So if you hear, listen carefully, you say, oh, this person is speaking Baba Malay. He's not speaking Baza Malay. And there are many signals like this. And why did they do this? They do this because they wanted to be distinctive because it was prestigious. Pre-independence, to be Baba. Not today, not today. Huh? today uh, <laughs> I don't think, uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> we are in our death throes. Uh, let's put it this way. Huh? But anyway, I will let um, Dr. Nala. Dr. Nala will tell you about the endangerment. Huh? In fact, uh, if you want to see Peranakan culture, you just go to the museum. Huh? And uh, right, let's look at a sample from 1899. The Babas were the literati, you know. So of course they're going to pronounce their Malay a little bit different, you know, from 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 the masses of the Malay from the other Malays. All right, okay. And this is the the literati, and this is from one of their novels. And I think that uh, Kenneth Tan probably is going to to show you a lot more cherita cherita Baba. So I'm not going to say very much. I'll just show you the sample. Huh? Since I'm going to, to talk to you from the linguistic lens, uh, look at this. Just look at this. This is in Baba Malay. Okay, this is Baba Malay. All right. So, uh, and now let me look at uh, some of my ancestors. Huh? Okay, in 1852, I was reading Song Ong Siang's book. Okay. Now, uh, what did they do? Okay, on the left, we have Tan Kim Singh. He's not exactly my ancestor, although there were intermarriages, okay? After third generation, there are lots of, by the way, the, the Babas were like the Malays, you know, they tend to marry their cousins and so forth. All right, so their gene pool isn't very good, you know, uh, for because uh, uh, they tend to intermarry, all right? And they were, as I, as I told you, they accommodated, became very much like Malay. They were wearing the sarong. They were ma uh, quite matrilineal, you know, if you have, a household, the woman would be quite strong, okay. So, uh, and sometimes the men would come and live with the with the girls, with the girls' family. That's Malay, no, that's not Chinese, okay. So anyway, let's talk about how what, how did they speak. We want to know how they spoke. Okay, this is a uh, extract from Song of Siam book. Okay, Tan Kim Seng spoke in English. Wow, Tan Kim Seng knows English. Tan Kim Seng wrote. Then he will tell a humorous story in Malay. When he wants to joke, he'll joke in Malay. When he wants to do business, he's going to speak in English. And then when he wants to speak to his employees, all the syncates huh, and the new arrivals, he's speaking Hokkien. Okay. So this was the same with Tan Tok Sing. All right. They were very multicultural, trilingual, multilingual. They were code mixing. They were code switching. All right. Uh, 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 and, and, and there were many generations. Both of them were from Malacca. And you know the Malacca, the Noya, and the Babas from Malacca, they were about four, five hundred years. They were native speaker of Baba Malay. Uh, Tan Tok Singh, actually, I, I'm from, from uh, my, 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 my great, 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 great grandmother is the eldest daughter of Tan Tok Singh. He's the one, he's the first Chinese who says, let this hospital be for all races. Because, you know, when the British came, they, they, they you know, they wanted to classify people, you know. Indians you go and live in little India. Chinese, Chinese go and live in little China. Okay, Arab go and live in Arab Street. Malays go and live in Gelang Sarai. All right. But and hospital, oh well, just only for British. But Tantok Singh, he says, hey, this is for everybody. 
he was the first uh, straight Chinese. He was the first Baba who says, this hospital is for everybody. I'm very, I am very proud of him, of course. So what language shall we use? You, you're from India, I'm from China. What language shall we use? Okay, if I'm a rickshaw puller, I'm first generation, I cannot speak English, I can only speak Malay. Uh, I mean, I cannot speak English, I cannot speak Malay. I can only speak Chinese. Huh? If you are the, a Malay schoolboy, okay, you can speak some Malay, a bit of English and Chinese. If you are a uh, Kim Seng, yeah? okay, uh, straight Chinese, you can speak English, Malay and Chinese. And if you are Indian, Indians are quite good linguists. Huh? Usually you can speak your Indian, you can speak English, and you can speak Malay as well. Let me tell you about the client. I developed this client, all right? If you are the first generation, probably you'll be speaking some pidgin and you'll be speaking to your own uh, Chinese language, whatever that language is, uh, whether it's Hainanese or whether it's Hakka or Hoklo or Hokkien or Cantonese or Teju or whatever it is, you'll just be speaking that language. Then you have a second generation. Now your second generation will no longer be speaking pidgin. They'll be speaking Creole. They will pick up the lingua franca, which is Baza Malay and Baba Malay. Those were the lingua franca. And the lingua franca was also Hokkien. Hokkien was also a lingua franca. All right. And by the time you go to the third generation, what happens? Third generation now can speak a bit of English. Okay. A bit of Hokkien, a bit of Malay. All right. So that Creole began to develop. It depends on what generation you are. How do we go from this to this? How do we go from eating Chinese food to eating Creole, from to eating laksa to eating billing bing, uh, 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 to eating blachan? Okay, uh, how do we go from eating kiam chai to blachan? <laughs> okay, so well, uh, let's look at the speed. Okay, let's look at the speed. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, the speed, by the way, is both ways, as I already told you. Malay is a very hospitable language. It absorbs. Hokkien is also very hospital, hospitable. There's no S about it, okay? Uh, we also absorb the both languages, all right? Now, it depends also on your wife. Your wife will help the speed of assimilation and accommodation and syncretization. Who will you marry? Who will you marry? There are only three types of women that you can marry, you know? There are only three types of women you can marry. The first is, you go and marry somebody from China, lah. send for her. There are very few women here. Number two, you go and marry the sing-song girl. Uh, you know, the, 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 the entertainer. Lah. You know, because there are some women who were brought here to be entertainers, prostitutes and all that. Okay, so that's the second type of women. And the third woman, you can marry a Noya girl. Okay, because the Noya has been here for years. But there are very few Noya women. So you need to be rich. You need to be rich. If you're not rich, you can't marry a Nonya, all right? Because they will only give their daughter to a Sinkate who have done very well. So if you've done very well, okay, you can marry a, a Nonya, all right? So we find that uh, there were a, a, a number of, of Sinkates. Huh? Uh, I don't mean it in a derogative way. Sinkate meaning the first generation, okay? Who were rich enough and they were able to uh, to have a Noya wife, okay? Right, so uh, if you have a Noya wife, then your assimilation will be faster, okay? Because your children will end up speaking uh, Baba Malay. If you marry a wife from China, your assimilation will be slower because your wife is from China, right? In which you have uh, imported her, okay? And, and same, if you marry a sing-song girl, also, uh, it, it will be not as uh, slow as the wife from China, but not as fast as your locally born wife. Okay, so it depends on uh, who you want to marry, okay? And that will depend on the, uh, the speed of the uh, assimilation or acculturation process, okay? And of course, if you're, it's your Noya wife, she'll probably play the uh, ch chiki, uh, yeah, chiki and then this as well, all right? So you will be acculturated faster, all right? So uh, there were many Sinkates who married Noya wife, like Tan Kaki. He had four wives, but there was one who was a Noya and, 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 and also uh, uh, many, many, many. Okay. So if you were a literati from China, okay, like one of my great, my great grandfather, he was a literati. He was a scholar, actually. 
you know, uh, uh, from, from China and scholars don't earn very much, but scholars are highly respected. So he, mani he managed to marry, he managed to, 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 to marry into the Tan Tok Seng uh, family, all right? So, uh, so why? Because he's a literati, so he can marry a Noya wife. So although he's his first generation, but he managed to marry a Noya wife. So we became uh, acculturated very fast because it is the woman who brings up the children and who teaches the children to, 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 to speak the patois, all right? Okay, let's now go into the 20th century. I have to be very fast now because it's already 15 minutes and I think I have to stop very soon. I just want to say this, as we go into the 20th century, by the way, everything I said just now was like 19th century and earlier, okay? So now let's go to the 20th century where Baba Malay began to morph, morph into Singlish, okay? Because Singlish is a subset of English, whereas Baba Malay is a subset of Malay. See the difference there, okay? So now we're going to have a bit more and more English and a bit less Malay and Hokkien. How did this happen? How did this happen? How come Baba Malay began to morph into Singlish? Okay, so now Singlish, English became slowly the main ingredient, all right, because Britain was at the height of its power, okay? And the Chinese, China was having a very, very hard time, okay, with the Opium War, losing the war to Japan, losing the war to Russia. It was in a terrible state. All right, so it was therefore, uh, you know, the, the migrants. Migrants are very pragmatic people, uh, all right? So if English, the, the British are doing very well, let's, let's speak a bit more English, shall we? Because we do want to speak the language of the emperor. We want to speak the language of trade. We want to speak the language of wealth, okay? So, uh, and we want to, you know, learn Shakespeare. We even perform a play on Hamlet. Which this, this was a play that was performed actually in the Kreta Aie Theatre in Singapore in 1910. All right. So they began to laugh things that were very uh, Anglophile. Huh? All right. And these are some of the, of the magazines uh, that the, the Straits Chinese uh, printed. And uh, you can look them up, Bintang Timo. And I think uh, maybe Kenneth will talk about this. I don't know. So I won't talk about this. And in the beginning of the 20th century, this is what Singapore looked like. This is a picture of Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen came to Singapore and he actually engaged, okay, many straits Chinese, like uh, Lim Boon King and all this, okay, uh, Song Ong Siang, Lim Boon King, and also a lot of, uh, of the first generation to help the Republican cause in China. Look at the people in Singapore. Can you see the, uh, the polyglot? Pot. Can you see how multicultural, multiracial, multireligious, multilingual we are? This was the natural state of affair. Everybody was a crossover. There was a big flow. Here is a sample of a Baba dialogue in 1899. Okay, I've taken this sample from a story. Okay, look at the Baba dialogue. I say, apa baru balik dari office? Eh, bukan, gua pergi si cim. Okay, and then I say, Guatau uh, Sichim, Kala Chiti, very stingy. Okay, so this, this was the Baba's talking. He's using uh, a bit of Chinese, he's using a bit of Malay, he's using more and more English now. All right, so there's lots of code mix, there's lots of code mix, okay? Uh, besides also code switching, huh? just like the, the Tan Kim Singh and the Tan Tok Singh and all this, all right? So here again, 50 years later, Okay, just let's say in the 1950s, okay, 1950s, all right. So here again, uh, can you see there is a lot more English, okay. Here we have the best man teasing the bride, all right. Kya sai minta sinyo satu kiss, sinyo kata, do as you please, all right. So this is Baba English for you, all right. We, we hardly hear this now, okay. Here's a picture from my, my family album. Let me just, uh, can, if you can give me another five minutes, I'll try to finish up, okay? Uh, this is my family album. You can see here, their identity is, uh, the, uh, this is my grandmother from, uh, this is my grandmother. This is my father, he's the youngest one. Oh, my grandmother is wearing, uh, my grandma's wearing a very Malay costume. And uh, my grandfather is just, is just wearing, uh, you know, 
this kind of office work clothes, okay? And his children are all wearing Western clothes. This is 1914, okay? This is 1914. So the woman is a Nunya, okay? The woman is a Nunya. And he, uh, you know, being a, from the uh, scholar class, was able to get a Nunya wife. So all his children uh, began to speak Baba Malay, okay? Uh, so she, we can see that she's very Baba. Okay, so then now uh, my grandfather, this is on my mother's side. That, 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 the other picture was on my father's side. My grandfather, okay, on my mother's side, Lee Chun Guan, okay? All right, he was very rich, okay? So, and he was, he had a lot of business with the, with the British as well. So you can see that he's wearing Western clothes, okay? This is the time when you, 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 you either want to be British or you want to be Chinese, okay? You don't really want to be Malay, all right? Uh, you only wanted to be Malay in the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, okay? But by the time of the 20th century, uh, the status has begun to shift a little bit. Nah? You can see that they admire all the things British. This is from my family album. I, I took this uh, uh, from my father's book. I could see that he had sponsored uh, uh, Chiu Giao Xiong's, my father, Challenge Cup. He gave a Challenge Cup for tennis. He was a sportsman. Okay, uh, and you know the straight Chinese, they like to, they, they like to be very British. They like to do polo, they like to ride horses, they like to uh, do tennis, you know, uh, they like to do swimming, and they like to uh, collect stamps, all right, and they had all these associations and all this, okay. So they had acculturated identities, okay, and, 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 and they were anglicized because the London Missionaries Society, all right, uh, uh, at that time, the Christians are very, very active, and uh, and 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 Singlish. Sing Singlish means there is now more English. Last time in the nineteenth century, the main ingredient was Malay and Hokkien, but now the the the, the main ingredient in the twentieth century seems to be increasingly English. Why is this so? Why? Why? Oh, because there were missionaries like Sophia Blackmore. Sophia Blackmore, for example, came from Australia. She set up the FMGS, she set up the MGS, she was active in ACS, okay? So all these schools, they began to, to, to speak English and so developed Singapore English, which began to compete with Baba Malay as the lingua franca, okay? So, and, they, and orthography didn't help either, orthography, okay? Because Rumi, Rumi, Rumi means the uh, Roman letters, okay? was selected. Traditionally, Malay was written in Jawi, okay? If you look at the Sejarah Malayu, it's all in Jawi, all right? You look at Munshi Abdallah, it's Jawi, okay? But now Rumi, they prefer Rumi because you know why? The missionaries who were also translators, they felt that Jawi was very Arabic looking. Can you see? Jawi looks like its mother, Arabic. Jawi is a daughter of Arabic. Whereas, Rumi, Romanized Malay, looks like its daughter, Latin. And as you know, we were a colonial, we were a colonial pot. And so the British says, we prefer the Rumi orthography because it looks like Latin. Okay, and we love Latin. After all, English is based on Latin. English is a daughter of Latin. We don't like Jawi, okay? Jawi looks like its mother, Arabic, okay? So we find that... Uh, because of the Romanization, Romanization, and most of the Straits Chinese, they also, pref uh, you know, because they were pro-British, all right, they also began to write all their materials using Romanized Malay, using Romanized Malay. And this orthography, language is ideology, this orthography began to mold in them a very pro-British Anglophile character. Because if every day you are staring at the Rumi script, you are staring at a Western face. The Rumi script looks Western. All right. You, you, it looks like you're staring at English. So we have Straits Chinese. This is from, uh, you know, Ui Tiam Ham's uh, daughter. Uh, by the way, Ui Tiam Ham was a sinkate, but he had a Noya wife. I told you, you got to be rich. Huh? You want to have a Noya wife. Okay. Look at how, 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 how they imitate that uh, Western dress. This is how they dress. 
Okay, this is the Baba elite. You can see Song Ong Siang here and Lim Boon King here. This is the way they dressed. Okay, it's no longer a Malay dress, you know, like in the 19th century. Okay, they want to dress like the colonial masters. All right. Okay, this is Alex Abishganagan. Huh? They like to copy the Western musicians. All right, the cowboys and all this. They like that. Okay, now, there was also a pro-China lobby because in 1919, we have the main, you know, the nationalist uprising in China. All right. And so there were some straight Chinese who began to say, hey, hey, guys, we got to be more Chinese and less Malay. We got to be more Chinese. Okay, and less Malay. All right. And so now what happened? Let's look at the picture of my two grandmothers. You know, uh, 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 this is my grandmother on the left. Okay, she's still wearing her, 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 her Malay dress. All right, uh, because they were, you see, because my grandfather had many wives. Okay, so my grandmother was the second wife because the first wife died. All right, so she was brought in as a child wife, child bride. This is the third wife of me. This is the third wife. This is Mrs. Lee Chun Guan. All right, who is very well known. All right, and she, she is now wearing a Chinese costume. She's straight Chinese, by the way. She's born here. She's straight born. All right, but she rather wear the Chinese dress. She rather wear the Chinese dress. Have you ever seen her in Sarong Kubaya? All right. So you see, dress denotes your affiliation. Look at my paternal grandmother from 1900. Look at the, the baju, uh, you know, look at the Malay dress. In 20 years time, due to the rise of nationalism in China, they've changed their clothing. Now she's wearing a Chinese kind of like a, a Chinese uh, kind of like a loose chong sum. And on the right is my, my mother, okay? So, so, so you see, dress tells us something, just like language. Language tells us our identity. Dress also tells us our identity, our affiliation, our likes, our dislikes. Okay? And, and of course, uh, you know, uh, religion, you know, straight Chinese, uh, more, the, the sermons began to be in the English, not just in Malay, all right. The English medium schools began to promote Singlish, so we had more, more, more. And even in my father's firm, this is a picture from my father's album. This is my father here, and these are his brothers. It's a family shop. Can you see it's very multiracial? In the front, all the Chinese, all our relatives, are because this is a family shop. They were ship chandlers, right? And on the back, can you see all the different type of Indians and Malay? Uh, the Malays usually the driver, uh, uh, you know, and then all the different Indians are doing different things. Uh, all right, they're doing all kinds of different things. Okay, so this was a typical, a typical multiracial, multilingual shop. Okay, the first row, all those who were born here. The second row, all those who were born abroad, migrants. It's just like today, we still have migrants. We are a migrant society. Okay, we're end ending. This is me. Hello. <clears throat> and this is my mother. All right. She 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 preferred to wear the sarong kebaya even in 1956 when I was a child. Okay, but this uh, but she mixed with all the Amos. Look, this is I uh, Singapore Island Club. We were still very Anglophile. Okay. All right, and then everything changed. This is the last slide. Uh -huh. Everything changed in 1959, right? Because it means the shredding of the Baba identity, right? Because in 1959, our narrative changed. It's not, you know, we, we now have uh, begin, we are now beginning to have this, you know, the CMIO model. We're going to systematize, you know, you just be Tamil, okay? Uh, uh, you just be Chinese or you just be Malay. You, you, you know, the, we, we don't recognize all these divisions. We're going to call them dialects. We're going to have the narrative of, of uh, struggling, you know, to fight for survival. That's the narrative, okay? We're very vulnerable. That's the narrative. We're also going to have a narrative of success. We are third world. Now we are first world. This is the narrative. We don't want the narrative of being syncretic. Okay, mixing here, mixing there. It's very messy. Very messy. All right? We, we, we like to be... Oh, systematic. We like everything in boxes, all right? We like to see everything clearly. So we have this uh, Lee Kuan Yew, 
let's call him LKY. He was straight Chinese, you know. His great grandfather came here, so he's about third generation, or, you know. His wife is also straight Chinese. His mother tongue is Baba Malay. Actually, I don't know of any other world leader that have that have discarded his mother tongue and put it to a museum. I don't know of any world leader who has done this because he has said, I, I, can't, I can't win the election if I retain my Baba identity. You know, I, I, please don't call me Harry anymore. Call me my, my Chinese name. I want my children to just learn Mandarin. And in my household, we don't speak Baba Malay, okay? Even though it's my mother tongue. Because my votes, my electorate is Chinese speaking. Okay, and the Baba is minority. All right, and we're going to promote Mandarin. And this is the last nail on the coffin, in my opinion. The last nail on the coffin for Baba Malay. All right, because Baba Malay is Hokkien based. It is not Mandarin based. Okay, and so uh, we are now, the, I mean, we are asking me what is the Baba Malay and the language. A lot of Peranakans after the Speak Mandarin campaign, all migrated to Australia, migrated to Canada. All my relatives all ran away because we're so scared of Mandarin. All right, uh, Mandarin is not part of the, it, uh, Mandarin is not part of the original language spoken here for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years, the language was spoken. So, and Mandarin is uh, a northern language, it's mutually unintelligible talking. But I can tell you that for many Babas, right, they, uh, oh, there are very few of them left actually. <laughs> uh, they now wish they could speak Mandarin, okay, because China is a rising power, okay, and we have a migrant mentality. We will learn the language of power, whichever language it is. So dear friends, uh, that's it for my talk. I have gone over with you. Dialects, dialogues, language. I talk about identities. I have talked about language change. So uh, I have gone over, slightly gone over my time. So I will just now leave it for questions and answers. So thank you, Dr. Chu, for the extremely insightful talk. Um, it was a very good opportunity to hear uh, the, the language in context of you know, the history and the culture that has been evolving in this region for many hundreds of years, not just you know, when colonial um, the period started. So in the meantime, the Q&A tab has been buzzing with a lot of activity. So we'll get to your questions. Um, we will take a quick um, break while I set up the Q&A slide. Oh, I better stop sharing. Huh? No, no worries. So, yeah. So if you have any questions, we, the, the Q&A section would have contained most of them. Um, we do not have uh, the time to address every question in interest of time, but we will try our best to um, address those that have especially been upvoted. So if you're interested in kind of checking questions that you, you would like to ask Dr. Chu, then please upvote the questions uh, and we will um, begin the question and answer now. So Dr. Chu, um, at the beginning you talked about kind of interchangeably using Baba Nyonya Straits Chinese and Chinese Peranakan uh, all together, but um, are there any accepted usages of these terms? And can you also elaborate on the politics of the usage of each term, if there are any? Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, because I wanted it to be a general talk, so I just used it interchangeably, okay? But actually, Peranakan is a more an Indonesian term. And just like straight Chinese, it's a geographical term. You know, you, 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 you can be uh, a sink, uh, you, 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 you know, you don't have to be a uh, second, third generation to be straight Chinese. So that's why they differentiate between straits born. That means you're born here, you're born here. So there's a difference. You're born here. So therefore you would understand certain things a little bit more, right? So uh, so yeah, yeah, there are differences, but it's, it's going to be very technical we go into this. So <laughs> I'd rather do uh, some very broad strokes, yeah. 
Um, okay, um, so perhaps this, this can be taken up at another time. Yeah. Um, but thank you for that question. Um, the next question it comes from Brian. He says, Dear Dr. Chu, thank you for a lively and fascinating talk. Throughout your talk, you have convincingly made the case that language should be a marker for communal identities. Um, but will the changes in the language core, such as the addition of Kristang English, um, necessitate a splitting of the communities in terms of dissimilarity in identities? Would speakers have disidentified with others as well? And this former okay. supervisor has sent her regards. So please. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So I just want to say this, that language always change. I want to tell you all this. Don't be afraid of change. Be afraid of only standing still. This is a quote from Confucius. Language always change. All right. And uh, whenever we meet someone of a different race, of different identity, we learn new language. If we like the person, we will incorporate the person's idiolect, the person's vocabulary into our own. This is very, very natural. This happens not just in Southeast Asia with the Baba Nunya community. This happens everywhere, all right? So even with a language like English, you know, it, it has a bit of Norwegian, it has a bit of German, it has a bit of Spanish, it has a bit of Italian. All right, so it's a roja, right? So actually, you know, language is, you know, when we meet people, we will assimilate the language. It's very, very natural. If you want to stop that process, like what the French is doing by having a French academy, all right, to make sure that French remain pure, Oh, then you're going to lose the race for being the lingua franca, all right? So it has lost the race, actually. It's not even a close second. It used to be the language of diplomacy. <coughs> but because of its insistence <coughs> on purity, compared to its rojak neighbor, English, it's really, really far behind. The reason why Baba, <coughs> Baba language has lasted for hundreds of years is <coughs> because of its fluidity and openness and because of its willingness to complement. Okay, so there is no split identity like the question suggests. No, we are all a hodgepodge of identity. This is the postmodern period. We don't have an essentialist mentality, you know, I can be Chinese now, but later on, you'll see that I can be uh, some other person. I can be a different race. I can be a different gender. I can even be a young person. I can be an old person. I can be a, I may be a teacher now. Later on, I can be a mother. I can be a wife. I keep changing my identity. This is postmodern concept of identity. It's not splitting. We are complex people. And language is complex. Language mirrors us. Okay, thank you for answering that question. Uh, slightly related to that, uh, we have a question from Che Cheng about how um, currently Baba Malay's vocabulary is limited to mainly daily usage and perhaps doesn't have the conceptual abstract or philosophical words or terms that you could find in other, language, uh, other languages. Would you therefore kind of see Peranakan culture and the language attached to that, especially used in this context as kind of limited? Uh, okay. Malay language has always been an oral language, okay? It's always been oral language. And as you know, Baba Malay is a subset of Malay. So therefore, its roots are very, very oral. So it doesn't have scientific vocabulary and all that, unless you borrow from, from English. But it doesn't mean that just because a language is, 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 is oral-based, that it is lousy or it is low status or, or whatever it is. Okay, so uh, 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 so I, I have answer, uh, answered this that yes, it's true. We, you know, it's not a philosophical language or what because it's an oral language. Okay, and uh, and, and I also want to say that today, uh, to answer the point that you said that uh, Baba speakers are quite limited in their vocabulary. Yes, because uh, I I told you that uh, there are very few. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, there are very few speakers of Baba now. You know. Uh, uh, we are in our death trolls. Huh? <laughs> very, very few. 
Uh, there may be some semi-speakers, semi-speakers, usually when a language is about to die. Okay? Language death, okay? Uh, uh, we are an endangered language, okay? But as I say, I think uh, Dr. Nala will talk about that. When a lang I know that it's about to die because there are only semi-speakers now for Baba Malay. What is semi-speaker? It means that I can't find anyone who can speak Baba Malay. Even myself, I can't speak Baba Malay. I can understand it. But I can't speak it. So I'm a semi-speaker. So when you come to that stage when there are only semi-speakers left, oh, that means you are uh, yeah, you are already fourth stage of cancer. Your fourth stage cancer. And don't ask about my daughter. She can't speak a single word. That's even worse. Okay. <laughs> Some sobering thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, for the final question before we wrap up for this session, SP asks, what is your opinion on the current issues of claims of cultural appropriation of how people shouldn't use terms or items of culture that is not of their own? Do you believe that this trend would be an enduring impediment to further syncretism in culture and especially in the case of language? Or is this a phase that may fade in and out of society? Okay. I want to answer it in this way. Whenever there is change, there is resistance. So whenever a language wants to absorb certain nomenclature or syntax, or syntax from another language, there will always be opposition. That people will say that you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't cross the boundaries, you shouldn't, you know, adopt certain words and so forth. But you know. If we look at change, you know, we have come from, uh, uh, we, we're getting bigger and bigger. Uh, that's why I think this study of Singapore Baba Malay is very fascinating because, because you know, because a uh, 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 Singapore can, can actually be a symbol for what may happen to the world. For instance, we, we were a tribe, right? And different tribes have to find a lingua franca to communicate. Okay, they have to find their own uh, Baba Malay. After the tribe, we have city-states. And different city-states have to find their own Baba Malay to communicate. Then we have nation-states. They have to find their lingua franca to communicate. So now we are the globe. Are you still going to say that we shouldn't, we, we should just stay in our own little nucleus? We should just stay in our own little silos? that we are afraid of losing our culture. Are you still going to say that? Can't you see historically that the progression has been from small to big? Can't you see also that there has been, that lingua franca keep linking us together? But of course, we are afraid, we are afraid. So we try to hold back, okay? We try to hold back. But I just want to tell you this, we should not, our culture will keep changing, you know, because the times change, technology change, so our culture change. We like different things at different times in our lives, right? So when our culture change, when technology change, our language also change. You want to stay in your little vacuum? Are you want to be a museum piece? Do you want to be locked in time where language is concerned? So. I think when you ask this question, I know you love your, I know you love your your culture very much, your mother tongue very much. Maybe not, but but you know, but but that's essentialism, as I already told you. We 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 always have to change. Life changes, and language will also change with life. It's a very good way to end off this entire session. Um, so that's all the time that we, that we have for today. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for um, giving such a wonderful um, talk as well as answering these questions in such a you know, poetic way as well. So um, thank you, everyone, um, for joining us on this program. For those of you who haven't visited uh, the Baba House yet, um, we are open for guided tours uh, and self-guided visits in limited numbers so more details can be found in this slide so please do drop by if you are interested in learning more about the culture uh, as well as the architecture of this house
And um, in relation to Dr. Chu's talk and her you know, links that she made to different speeches and different speakers throughout the series, um, these are the speakers that we have next in the Dialects and Dialogues series. Uh, you can catch a glimpse of the titles and the dates here. So please do check them out and attend if you can so that you can see a more holistic kind of view um, that branches off from this initial talk. So finally, please leave your feedback here through this QR code. We, will, we can also send a link through the chat so that is all from us. We hope you enjoy uh, this talk and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. So see you in two weeks for the next okay. installment of this talk, the series. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.